replicated across the country. This is the Research Impact Canada webinar. My name is Michael Johnny, hosting today, also the co-chair of our Professional Development Committee. Thank you very much for making the time to join us. Today's webinar is led by Dr. Rick, uh, David Phipps, who works at York University, and he's gonna be sharing um, information and his experience around planning for impact. So over the next hour, David will be sharing some slides and leading a, a, a conversation. This is being recorded and it will be placed on the Research Impact Canada website uh, within a few weeks. If you could please utilize the chat function if you have any questions and I will support the moderation of that. David said you could ask questions at, at any time. Um, also, if you could please mute your microphone uh, during the presentation. That would be wonderful. Enjoy the next hour. David, thank you very much and over to you. Great, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you everyone for joining. I hope wherever you are, you are managing the snow. Um, if you're joining from the Southern Hemisphere, you're managing the heat. And um, it, um, I, I'm actually, I'll let Michael say, Eric, how, um, how do you mute? Oh, how do you mute? Um, right. So if you scroll, Eric, on the lower left-hand side, you'll see a mute function, and you can just click that and scroll yourself. So I am going to flip into um, SlideShare right now, uh, share my slides, and, and then we will get started with uh, the presentation. Michael, can, oh, sorry, can sure. you confirm you can see my slides? I can indeed. Excellent, thank you. So I'm going to be, um, and Michael, I would ask that you make me shut up at about quarter to one um, right. our time in about 45 minutes, just so we've got time for questions. But I do welcome questions throughout, and Michael has no problem um, interrupting me. He's done that very well for the last 12 years, and I encourage him to do it over the next 45 minutes. So I'm going to talk about supporting research impact in grant applications, and I'm going to be talking about a specific tool that um, we have developed at York University and that um, I've personally used, and I will illustrate it with one example from how we've supported the knowledge mobilization strategy of a SHRC partnership grant and um, I, I will talk if there's any non-Canadians on the line because we do have the University of Brighton um, from the UK I'll talk a little bit about SHRC uh, what SHRC is but it's a mainly Canadian audience so I won't go into too much detail about that so all this to say is that in Canada creating an impact strategy in your grant application is a function of most of our funders it's certainly, um, uh, SHRC calls it a knowledge mobilization strategy, CIHR calls it a knowledge translation strategy. Depending on the program, NSERC will call it a commercialization strategy, and commercialization is a form of knowledge mobilization. But certainly the health uh, charities, um, all the health charities have knowledge translation strategies, provincial agencies like Alberta Innovates and Michael Smith, especially Michael Smith, a very strong focus on creating impacts, Alberta a very strong focus on assessing impacts. And then and also groups like CFI, Canada Foundation for Innovation, all these grant applications have a section called Benefits to Canada. And that is what is the difference your research is going to make. And usually, what is the difference your research is going to make on Canadians? And, and publishing your research and graduating your students is absolutely critical for the work that we do. But the scholarly impact is not the type of impact that we're talking about today. So all of our um, funders are now asking for impact strategies. Oh, and the NCEs, which has um, been given a, a final five years uh, before they close the program, all networks of centers of excellence, their mandate is to create socioeconomic benefit to Canadians by doing research and translating or mobilizing that research into impact for Canadians. So in 2013, I was part of a committee that was advising SHRC on how to assess or how to evaluate their knowledge mobilization funding programs. And the evaluators who were retained for this evaluation, they said to me, David, you know, all the knowledge mobilization um, uh, models are difficult to evaluate. If you can think like the knowledge to action cycle, the CHR cycle with a, a, a funnel in the middle and a circle around the outside and everything's got double-headed arrows and, and in animated versions it spins. You know, if it doesn't begin somewhere, and if it doesn't end somewhere, it's hard for evaluators to evaluate that. So I said, David, could you bring forward a simple conceptual think for or, or model for knowledge mobilization? And this is um, in front of you what I developed at that time. The theory is that campus 
actors and not and air quotes community air quotes because community could be people in the community they could be industry they could be government they could be nonprofits they could be people with lived experience we tend to sit in different spaces and knowledge mobilization is a series of actions and services and tools that help bring the community and campus actors into shared spaces. That shared space might be a space of knowledge transfer, which means I have something and I give it to you. It might be a place of knowledge translation, which means I have something and I translate it into accessible formats that you can use. It might be a space of knowledge exchange where I have something and I give to you, and you have something and you give to me and we're engaging and listening as well as talking. And it might be a space of shared co-production or collaboration. And sometimes when we share these spaces, impacts occur. And so my simple definition, which fits in a tweet, especially now that they've enlarged the characters to 280, is that knowledge mobilization helps make research useful to society by supporting engaged scholarship from inception to impact. A few things that are key in here, it helps make research useful to society. So it's, it's, um, it's taking research from the, the lab or the academic space and into a social or society space. The engaged scholarship. So it's, I wrote a piece once for the National Coordinating Center on Public Engagement in the UK that engagement is a necessary precursor for impact. And I'll talk about why that is shortly. And then the idea from inception to impact. This isn't something we just do at the end of the journey. This is something that ideally we want to support all the way along the process from research to impact. And again, I'll show how um, this simple diagram that has a lot wrong with it, mainly that it's linear, and we know that no instance of knowledge mobilization is a linear process, but it's a helpful conceptual um, model um, to help the evaluators at SHRC really think about what something is at the beginning and what something is at the end. So if we think about um, the same model and we put knowledge mobilization words into this in that at the beginning, if we are going to be planning our knowledge mobilization or planning our impact, that's the knowledge mobilization strategy. Or it could be the pathway to impact if you're writing a EU, a European Union grant. It's your impact strategy. This is how we make impacts. And at the far end, the, the what of impact is where we do impact assessment. It's the what has occurred. This could be your outcome statement in a SHIRT grant. It could be impact assessment if you're in Alberta doing Alberta Innovates, or generally your evaluation plan. And this sets up a logic that if Impact is what we want to have happen, and then knowledge mobilization or impact planning is how we go about that. In evaluation language, the impact is the dependent variable, and knowledge mobilization is the independent variable. Knowledge mobilization are the things we change in order to observe or measure a difference in the impact. And so it sets up this logic between how we do something and what we do something, and that impact planning is a form of, of ex ante impact assessment where we're operationalizing the impact right from the beginning. And then again, if um, uh, taking this a little bit further into the conceptual model, if we lay a logic model, and again, we appreciate that logic models are linear, but this is a linear, albeit limited, uh, with those limitations model. And if we do a logic model, which says there are activities, and those activities have outputs, and those outputs have outcomes, and ultimately those outcomes have impacts. This might be short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes, which I'm calling impacts. That's a generic lo logic model. Now, if we underline knowledge mobilization research words under that, I'm going to do the co-produced research and just put that off to the side for a moment. The activity we do is dissemination. Uh, we've done research. We disseminate that research. Somebody takes up that research. There's this moment where it leaves the academic space and somebody takes up that research and they says, is it any good? They evaluate that against what they're currently doing. And if it is any good, they're going to use that. They're going to implement that into policies practices and services. And it's those policies, practices and services that have an impact on the lives of end users, of Canadians or of frogs if you're looking at lakes. And so, so we, we get this logic that research gets disseminated, is taken up by another organization who then implements that into policies, products and services, and those have an impact. Now, there's, I'll talk briefly about this concept of attribution. There's a question of attribution. How much of the impact at the end can you attribute to the research that was done at the beginning? Because we all know there's lots of other inputs along the way. And this is a very important concept because um, people struggle with attributing 
um, uh, research or retributing um, certain, like what percentage of the impact was driven by the research. And this is very important if you're a funder. Uh, it's also uh, because funders want to be able to say, especially if they're, if they're donors in international development where attribution plays a lot. But interestingly, I was reading about attribution because in our practice at York University, where we primarily support co-produced research, with co-production being a method of knowledge mobilization, is Annette Boaz from King's College wrote in a, a report a number of years ago that the method of knowledge mobilization could affect the attribution. For example, she said that if you co-produce knowledge, you could have an impact, that's the dotted line, even before you finish the project because the function, the act of collaborating can change the, the beliefs, the behaviors, the awareness of the collaborators, even before you've done the project. So that this co-produced research may actually have an impact even before the project is finished. And so remember how I said to you, this is a linear model and all the other models have double-headed um, circles going around and double-headed arrows. Well, this is my double-headed arrow and circular model. It is still it's what we call the co-produced pathway to impact. And I'm building this up for you so you can understand a couple of the tools that I'm going to be presenting. You still see we do research that is disseminated. Somebody takes it up. There's this implementation into policies, practices, and services. And those policies, practices, and services have an impact on the lives of citizens. You can see at the bottom the, um, the reference that we published on this. We published it with Prevnet, who was um, uh, an NCE in knowledge mobilization in bullying prevention. So a couple of features here. It's co-produced in that academics and co-production partners can work all the way along this process together. They can, um, they, we often talk about bringing the end user upstream to inform the research. What we like to also talk about is how do we bring the researcher downstream to help inform especially uptake and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So we co-produced, um, there's a central co-production zone in here. You see the stakeholder engagement at the bottom. It's really important that we listen to stakeholders to understand what are their um, concerns, what are their needs, so that we're doing research that is meaningful to stakeholders as well as to academics. And here's the key piece. Well, there's a lot of key pieces, but here's another key piece. You notice the impact is a function of the partner space. It's not a function of the academics. And I say to my academics, you, pointing at them, don't make any impact. You make your scholarly impact, but you don't produce products. Industry does. You don't develop policy. Government does. And you don't deliver social services. Community does community and nonprofits does. So if you want your research to have an impact on the lives of citizens, we do that by supporting collaborations between you as an academic researcher and co-production partners from the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. The other, another feature of this pathway is there are um, examples of benefits under each of these areas. And these actually create buckets or categories of indicators that you can develop along the, to, mo to monitor along the way. And on the right-hand side, a number of networks of centers of excellence have, adapt, have adopted and adapted this, um, this model. Um, and uh, another large, the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. The Canadian Observatory on Homelessness has also adapted this model for its, or adopted this model for its own purposes. So it's actually being used in, in, in practice. I'm going to um, walk you through one example of how this has been used. This is an example from Kids Brain Health Network and a program called Social ABCs, which is a program that um, has come out of research on early, um, on early children with early delays, that, um, developmental delays that may be six, um, signs of um, autism. Um, but at a critical time where, aut uh, where, aut where autism or fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are not necessarily diagnosed until four to six years old, and the earlier you can get, um, you can get uh, interventions in with these kids and the families, the better the, um, the developmental outcomes are. So one thing we did was we listened to stakeholders, we identified the needs, and parents identified their number one need was specialized training for educators. My kid is spending more time in school than he or she is spending at home. So I need the people that my kid is with to have specialized training. We want treatment for the child as soon as possible, I mentioned that, and we want more resources and more efficient use of resources. And so research that was addressing this was, under, was done at Bloorview Kids Rehab in collaboration with early childhood education practitioners. So right away, we're setting up a co-production method between um, researchers and clinicians at Bloorview, as well as practitioners, early childhood educators. And you'll see along the way, we're engaging with families as well. And the Ministry of Community and Youth Services was at the table funding some of the testing. And then, um, so the research happened, dissemination, the researchers published their papers, they went to their academic conference, 
conferences, but they also went to family events and they retained us being the Knowledge Translation Core facility for Kids Brain Health Network to develop a parent manual. They had a manual for early childhood educators, but they recognized they needed to continue the efforts at home. So we helped them develop a parent manual. That was dissemination. The uptake was that the early child, the researchers trained the early childhood educators in a train the trainer model, and the early childhood educators trained the parents. So we had uptake of this through the system of care uh, between in uh, clinical researchers, early childhood education, and parents. And then the implementation of that was that it was implemented in community settings in homes. And it was implemented in institutional settings in early childhood education. And I won't play the link here, but when you get the slides for this, I should mention, uh, Michael, I've put a link to all the slide to the slides and the tools I'll be showing later. That's in the Dropbox link. And I say to people, if uh, to the folks listening, if you are at a Research Impact Canada University but you don't have access to that, it's because your local Research Impact Canada representative does have access. And you can always email us, and we will make an introduction to your local Research Impact Canada representative. Anyway, this impact, this is a global news story about one kid, Alex, who was a beneficiary of this program. He was nonverbal when he was 30 months old, and by five years old, he was just chatty, and it's a really lovely, short little story. So this shows how listening to stakeholders, identifying needs, Come planning your research to meet those needs and then disseminating that, having an organization take it up and implement that into a service that has an impact. It's a, it's a, it's a lovely little story. And this is the impact, the slide again, but that York University and um, to some degree with collaboration with uh, Research Impact Canada universities, we've developed tools at each of the stages along the way of this pathway. So this is how the pathway is really fundamental to understanding where are the tools we need to provide supports for our researchers and students and their partners in order to help them plan and disseminate, help them take up the, help another organization take up the research, how do we do stakeholder engagement and how do we um, evaluate or asset, collect the evidence of the impact of this. So one of the tools I'm going to be talking about is this tool right here. It's the tool for planning your impact strategy in your grant application. But Michael, I'm, before I move on into the tool, I'm going to pause there and just could you let me know if there are any questions that are in the chat? All good right now, David. Okay. I'm just going to hold maybe 20 seconds in case someone wants to ask a question at this point. We need kind of like elevator music <laughs> in the background. I could sing Jeopardy theme song. But this is being recorded, so I don't really want to do that. Anyone, um, anyone typing or any comments? No. no not okay. Anything. All good. So, so we'll move on, and I'm, I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into a tool that we've developed to help researchers plan in grant applications. I should also mention that uh, Michael and I work in the Office of Research Services at York University, and so um, one of the foci, one of the lenses that we put in our knowledge mobilization work is in supporting researchers in the grant application process. So um, uh, again, on the bottom red bar, you'll see an article that um, Michael and Krista Jensen and Annalise Poets from Kids Brain Health Network and I published in 2017 about supporting knowledge mobilization strategies. It's not about what's on the left. That's, an, that's a nice diagram. You can get the article. It's open access. Uh, you can just Google it. But we find that a knowledge mobilization strategy um, has five elements. It's got who are your partners or your audiences? Your audiences are people you're going to disseminate to, but who are the partners that people are going to work with, as well as your stakeholders you're going to listen to? Who are the goal, what are the goals of your research, of your impact strategy? What are your activities? What is your, how are you going to assess the impact or collect the evidence of impact, and then what's the budget? And what we find is that our researchers are pretty good at talking about who their audiences are, who they're going to be working with. The goals are okay, but they're often not co-produced goals. They're often very academically focused goals. We find that there's a good um, focus on activities by our researchers who are preparing these grant applications, but their focus is primarily on dissemination. They're not necessarily focusing on stakeholder engagement, on um, on uh, co-production methods, certainly not in facilitated uptake. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and they're really not good on impact assessment. And then the budget is kind of okay some of the times, but often it's underestimated. This, these are legitimate activities that are all eligible expenses on SHRC and other tri-council grants in Canada. And oftentimes we will see, oh, I'll budget for a 10-hour a week undergraduate students to do this work. 
and that's just not sufficient to be able to really do the work that is that we need to get done in this. So I'm going to, I'm going to explain how these five elements have been derived from the co-produced pathway to impact. So what we see is um, that number one, there you'll see three ones, one A at the bottom, is who are the stakeholders? This is, this is the part for, number one is partners, two is goals, three is activities, four is your um, assessment and evaluation. So one, who are your audiences? So one A are the stakeholders. Who are you listening to? So these are the people that you need to listen to. And I'll tell you a story that comes out of the Rick Hansen Institute. And if there's anyone from Rick Hansen on the call um, on the webinar, please do um, type in the text box if um, the story I'm telling is apocryphal or if it's real. But I've been told twice by Rick Hansen folks, so I think it's real, is that when Rick Hansen, he was the guy in the wheelchair, um, a wheelchair athlete, wheeled around the world, raising awareness and funds for spinal cord injury, um, research. He got back to Canada, was given money by the government to start up the Rick Hansen Institute. And the first thing he did was he went out and talked to stakeholders. And clinicians and researchers said the most important things are biomarkers and um, neuroimaging. And when he went to talk to people living with spinal cord injury and their families, they said bladder control and erectile dysfunction. It's not that neuroimaging and biomarkers are wrong, it's just that they're only seen as priorities through one lens of expertise. The expertise of lived experience brings forward other ideas. So 1A, who are you listening to? And to be able to inform your types of works. 1B is who are your co-production partners? And then 1C are who are your audiences or your receptors who are taking up that research? Everyone is a stakeholder. Everyone involved in this is a stakeholder. They've all got a vested interest in it, but your um, uh, but, and your co-production partners are a subset, but not all stakeholders are co-production partners. And then your receptors, not all your receptors are co-production partners either. So they're all stakeholders, but you've got a larger audiences of, of uh, receptors of receptors, and you've got a smaller group of co-production partners. I'd like to say that you listen to stakeholders, you give to, you disseminate to your receptors, and you work with, you collaborate with your co-production partners. Those are your ones. So remember under one, don't remember this too much because I'm coming to it in the next slide. And then with your co-production partners or your stakeholders, you'll see the number two on the top left-hand side. How are you collaborating with them to define the goals? So the goals of your research to impact program, which are both academically rigorous, but also relevant to your stakeholders. And then I'll flip back. You remember number three is your activities. There's four types of activities, 3A, is how you've identified who are your stakeholders, then how are you listening to them? 3B is what's the type of co-produced research you're going to do? 3C is what are your dissemination activities? And 3D is this really important facilitated uptake. We often just think of disseminating or sending our, our material to our end users. And I always say it's great that a researcher has done a policy brief. Nobody's going to read it. It's great that a researcher posted that policy brief on her website. No one's going to read it. It's great she tweeted it out on her to the policy brief link to her website. Few people are going to actually download it. Even fewer are going to read it. Only when she goes into government and facilitates the uptake of that evidence in the context of its use does that research evidence really get looked at? So I encourage our researchers to be able to budget in with their co-production partners to get out of the lab or the studio or out of the um, off campus and get into the context of the use of that evidence and facilitate the uptake. So that's 3D. And then number four is the collection of the evidence of impact. What we've done is we, so you'll see how we've built up this um, co-produced pathway to impact. We've identified where there are areas for where we need tools. <clears throat> and we've, we've done the, the planning tool based on each of these stages of the uh, co-produced pathway to impact. And this is the tool that we actually use. So I do two things with the researchers when I'm sitting with them is one, I sit with them with actually this slide on a piece of paper and I make them write on it, who are, what's your one A? Who are your audiences? You know, what's your 1B? Who are your co-production partners? We actually write it by hand on a piece of paper. And then I send them away and I have them do it into this format. And all of these tools are available in the Dropbox, so you don't have to be worried about trying to scribble them down. They're all available to you. Please take them. I'm delighted if you do, and I'd love to know who's using them. But you can see here, we've broken it into a one page, eight by 10. What's your project title? You've got 1A, 1B, 1C. Who are your partners? I'll come back to this, flip the problem. And then three, what are the activities? 
excuse me, 1A is your stakeholders. What are you going to do to listen to them? So you see 1A, who are you listening to? 3A, what will you do to listen to them? 1B, who are you collaborating with? 3B, what will you do? 1C, who are you disseminating to? And 3C and 3D, what will you do to disseminate to them? And how do you know? The goal of the program is, is, is flip the problem. If the problem is high rates of teenage pregnancy, the goal is we want to lower rates of teenage pregnancy. Michael says. Just to interject, there, there is a question uh -huh. uh, from Thane from University of, of Alberta. Uh, this model is fantastic. It seems very social science focused. How do we translate that into a model for researchers in humanities disciplines, for example, uh, a historian working on Greek plays or m medieval bloodletting, which is right. fascinating. Uh, it's, it's a good question, Thane. Thank you for asking that. Um, I, I will just show you briefly that you can see, this is not the humanities conversation, you can see that I've been, for STEM people who are doing commercialization under dissemination, there's IP including patents, a technology license under uptake, and new products developed under implementation. That's not an answer to your question. Within the humanities, we're not looking so much at policy, um, at informing policy or practice. The humanities are um, mostly concerned with um, raising awareness Awareness, raising understanding, creating informed citizens, creating informed electorates, for example, and, and critical thinkers. And what we often find is that um, this dissemination and the uptake takes place as public engagement. So how is a, and I'll give you an example from Dalhousie University, if there's anyone from Dal on the line, is that they have a Canada Research Chair, a Tier 1 in, in English, and her work is on goth literature. And so what she does for her knowledge mobilization is she takes her, and it's particularly the portrayal of women and girls in goth literature, and she takes her research into comic conventions, and she gives, gives public talks to um, groups of, of, you know, grade eight and other ages um, girls, and she says, I know that my, my research has made a difference to their understanding and their beliefs because the questions they ask at the beginning are different than the questions they ask at the end. And so what we often find is that the uptake and the implementation is not around instrumental use of that evidence in a policy change, but it's about conceptual application of the research in ways that help um, through public engagement in ways that help uh, raise public understanding and awareness of research and research evidence and helps create critical thinkers. Michael is, is uh, Thane commenting, and um, she got anything more to add? Haven't seen anything yet. There was a comment okay. from uh, Oliver. This research imp impact plan template looks great. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Oliver. So Thane, uh, come back, um, especially if, um, if you're from the humanities or you know people who are about how they might be able to use this, but it is through more of a, um, a public engagement lens. Uh, David, and also there, actually, yep. Sorry, the, Thane has written back. Thank you for the excellent examples. Can we expand the template? Oh, absolutely. Um, I would invite you to send to it, try that expansion and send it back to me and see what that looks like. Um, and thinking, and it's not just, not just the humanities, right? It's um, if you think of cosmology, we've got a researcher who's got an instrument on a spaceship that is circling an asteroid right now and is mapping the surface of this asteroid to find the right place to lower down an arm that will basically vacuum up a bunch of asteroid dirt and then send that back to, um, to Earth. And we'll analyze that um, and, and its origins of the universe stuff because we know that asteroid is older than Earth. That's never going to inform a policy. That's never going to inform it. No one's going to sell that asteroid. But what our researcher does is um, he was just recently at the Royal Ontario Museum and he was giving a talk, an open public talk, about the, about the mission. And so there, there are ways that even beyond humanities, there are some STEM disciplines that don't lend themselves nicely to this instrumental use of evidence, but the conceptual use of evidence to raise awareness and beliefs and understandings is, um, is an important aspect. Okay, so... Shirk, I'm not going to go into too much of what Shirk is. I think most of us know that. But here's um, Nambuso Delamini. She is a professor in the Faculty of Education at York University. She was the inaugural Jean Augustine Chair in Education in New Urban Environments. Uh, she focuses her work around um, black youth and black youth being involved in, um, in communities and in small P and big P politics. And she has a grant application pending right now into the Shirk Partnership 
Leadership Grant Program, um, which is titled Black Youth in Leadership from Participation to Mobilization. Now, Nambuso, third time lucky, we hope, because uh, it's still pending. Uh, she's had two kicks at the can and she couldn't get past the LOI stage. And so I worked with her on her third attempt, um, pleased to say that she was gone to full application. This is a program that funds up to two and a half million dollars over four to seven years. And um, I worked with her and the, the, the reason she didn't get forward wasn't just because of knowledge mobilization, but I worked with her on her knowledge mobilization plan. And this was the um, calendar, not that we planned it, but this is just what happened. We met in August. This was post LOI. We met in August. I provided overall guidance. She sent me the first version of the plan. Uh, and you'll see, because I'm going to show you these plans. Um, you'll, it was amusing. I emailed her the tools. I said, work through the tools. We met to go through them together. Um, we then, again, then two days later, got her second version. I provided email feedback. I'll show you what that looked like. A third version, and then we met on the Friday before it was due on the Monday, just to wrap it up. So this is what the calendar looked like. Of, um, sorry, I just have to move my window here. Uh, this is what the calendar looked like, where we had this initial meeting in September, but then became quite busy in October, and um, and finally she submitted on October 29th. And while this, I shouldn't say this is all David, right? While this is going on, other support systems at the university were supporting her application through the um, through the um, HQP or the trainee program and through the research program. So. What I'm going to show you is, is just the iterations and how, how I worked with her. We've got the editions, um, the four editions of what she sent me September 17th, what she sent me October 5th, October 20th, and the final. I'm just going to quickly kind of show you what she did here. I'm going to share some other examples. So um, this is interesting. Okay. So Michael, not everything is showing up. Okay. And four. Okay, let me just open it again. Sorry about this. I'll just have to go back in and plan it up. Okay, so for so okay, impact plan. Here we go. So this is the first one. Uh, she has two pages. You can see that um, she had some little bit up here. And then she gave a page long table with project timelines, progress indicators, and knowledge mobilization plan. It, and, it, and then all of this blank page. page. So this is what first came in. It's the knowledge mobilization plan was primarily a, um, was primarily a, a, a timeline of what she was going to deliver. So I'm going to stop sharing that. So then you'll recall that we met. And I gave her some tools. So the next one that came in was um, she hadn't changed this. I actually wrote for her this first piece. Our knowledge mobilization plan is based on the co-produced pathway to impact. Gave her the reference for that. She had no goal. You'll see the overall goal of the knowledge mobilization plan is two. So I told her she needed a goal. She had her methodologies. I commented these are mainly dissemination. One thing she had here her community and youth participants were co-researchers through participatory action research. She had mentioned in the research plan that she's doing participatory action research, but it didn't come, didn't, um, come into the knowledge mobilization plan as a method. So it's really important that we join up the research plan with the training plan with the knowledge mobilization plan. And one thing I'll just quickly show in her, um, she had a timeline here. In each of these sections, you can see evaluation. What will you measure? What will you measure? What will you measure? So I sent that back to her. And then the third version that I got, let me stop sharing this. And I will now share the third version. So, so you'll see that um, the goal of the knowledge mobilization to plan is to increase knowledge uptake by target audiences to facilitate and support the civic leadership of black youth in their community and in the life of Canadian polity. So she, she put in her goal. Um, I'm not gonna walk all through this. I recommended this goes under methodologies because she's talking about her website and a website is a dissemination method. And here you'll see evaluation. She'd put in how she's thinking about evaluation in each of these sections. 
And again, um, I've talked about need to align the language because she had different language in this section than she did up above. So you just see doing what we do with um, corresponding back to um, participants. And then I will show the final version. Oh, that's not it. So let me stop sharing that one. And this is the final version. And you'll see her goal is there. She specifically um, got the different methodologies in here, including the, um, the website under the dissemination. And under her timeframes, she's um, specifically given what is she going to evaluate, what she's going to monitor in year one, in year two. And this is the final version that went in. I'm not giving you access to all of that because she hasn't given me permission to share all these in, in documents, but I don't mind showing you that just the use of these tools and the iteration with a research impact practitioner such as myself can support her work in, um, uh, can support her work and her application. And now let me get back to our presentation. And now, fingers crossed. Michael, can you see my fingers crossed? Are we back? Excellent, thank you. So fingers crossed, we, um, we're preparing her for her site visit and her interview right now. And um, we, we should be hearing sometime um, in the late spring about the results of this application. Michael, I'm gonna pause there before going on to show another couple of tools. No problem, David, just to let you know, there's a little less than 10 minutes left until yep. uh, a quarter two. Thank you. Um, the most recent comment, is there a link to the template? So your eight by 10 that goes through the steps. Yes, there is in the comment section. If you scroll up, you'll see a link to Dropbox. If you are not a Research Impact Canada representative, you won't have access to that Dropbox. But if, uh, if you are, click on that and share. If you're not, send an email um, to Michael and myself. Michael, if you could share our emails. And then what we'll do is we will make an email introduction between you and your Research Impact Canada representative, and they'll be able to share these materials with you. But the, the co-produced pathway to impact and the eight by 10 impact strategy document, those are both uh, um, in the Dropbox as PDFs. And I would love to know what you're doing with them. Okay, so this is, um, that's what we do with a Shirk Partnership Grant. It's two and a half million dollars. York University submits about 70 or so insight grants and another 20 or 30 insight development grants. We can't provide that degree of support to insight grants to all of them. So this is the insight grant um, sort of example. And, and, but what we do is we've developed this, um, this uh, conceptual, um, sorry, and this conceptual two by two matrix that says there are two main audiences you're going to work with academic audiences and non academic audiences on the left. And there are two main ways that you inter that you're going to engage with these audiences one on the left hand side, you're going to disseminate and on the right hand side, you're going to integrate or you're going to collaborate with them. And so we've broken out, these are the types of things that you will disseminate to an academic audience. These are your academic publications, your choreographies, your books, um, and your, your scholarly workshops, or your, sorry, your scholarly conferences. But integra um, integrating or collaborating with other academics, these are your workshops or, or co-produce or co collaboration wikis. Um, scholarly workshops and other academic collaborators, you don't need our help on this. I say ROs, that's the research officer. At York University, each faculty has a one or more research officers, and we provided this to them as a heuristic to help them think about how, we, how they can support their researchers. But if you think about um, disseminating to non-academic audiences, clear language summaries, other non-traditional forms of research dissemination at that link, We've got um, talking about theater, talking about infographics, social media is another one. We've got a worksheet um, where we've helped, um, where we provide some information for our research officers to support their faculty. But it's in the lower right um, quadrant where York's Knowledge Mobilization Unit will get involved in, a, in an insight grant, you know, through non-academic collaborations, hosting a town hall, audit and feedback of um, using a panel of non-academic stakeholders. So please contact Michael Johnny for support in developing uh, integrated knowledge mobilization strategies. Small print, note one. This is what note one says. We cannot do this work if you bring it to us the week before it's due, right? If we, if we want to help you build relationships with collaborators, non-academic collaborators, we need four to six months to do this work. 
If you've got an established relationship, we still need, need one month by September 15th at the latest to work with you and your partner in developing meaningful strategies that are meaningful for both. So um, the very small print, note one, is a very big idea. And so we, we manage the expectations of our researchers by helping them work with us um, according to timelines that will be able to develop a, deliver meaningful service. And now the last thing, Michael, that I'm going to talk about, I know I've got five minutes left, is these two checklists. This, is, this was developed for research, for research administrators who are reviewing grant applications. And the idea of this checklist is that um, when you're faced with an with a impact strategy in a grant application, how uh, we need a tool to help us re reviewing it know whether they've got the elements. These two tools are in the Dropbox as well, so you can use them. The one on the left is what we would use for a partnership grant. It's four pages long. It really breaks down into quite a lot of detail the expectations of uh, um, a complete impact strategy. The one on the right is um, a summary checklist that is only one page long, and it's based, and and it is just the high level of all the detail that is in the one on the left. So I, under number two, are the activities clearly described? My activities include, and I want them to write it down. If they can't write it down, the reviewers are never gonna see it. The audiences and end users are clearly described. My audiences and end users are. So then project partners, time frame and milestones, the anticipated benefits to the audiences are clearly described. So the milestones is what are you gonna measure along the way? The anticipated benefits is what's going to happen at the end. The indicators for these data and data sources are, are described because it's one thing to say we're going to measure according to this data set, but if you don't have access to that data set, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to be able to do the work. And then finally, the budget. And so this is a checklist that I encourage you to download and use when you've written your, if you are a researcher, when you've written your grant application, do all these things appear? And if you're a research administrator, when you're reading a grant application, do these elements appear in the strategy that you're reading? And again, there's a link at the bottom and the red um, bar at the bottom because we presented these tools in a blog post and they're also downloadable from that. The slides for this are in the Dropbox. So um, the last thing I'm going to mention then is uh, we have at York University and um, in parts in collaboration with Research Impact Canada universities developed our tools. And these are the tools with the links to all the tools. We haven't been good knowledge mobilizers because we haven't made them easy to find. We haven't indexed them. We don't, and we're going to do that. But we've got the first four, first five are these guides that we've developed with Kids Brain Health Network. Guides for stakeholder engagement, um, impact assessment, infographics, evaluation, and, um, and uh, dissemination. Sorry, impact planning, infographics, evaluation, dissemination. And these guides are, rather than doing our own, we've gone into the literature. We've identified four, five, or six guides that exist. We've done an annotated bibliography and then, in some cases, created tools to be able to implement. Um, there's uh, on the Research Impact Canada website, there is a tool for planning your knowledge mobilization event, tool for a policy forum that was developed by the University of New Brunswick. We're developing a tool to collect the evidence of impact. We're not there yet. Michael, I'll come to you in just a second. No problem. And then um, the impact strategy checklist that I just talked about is at that link. So um, on all of these links are live on the PDF slides that are in the Dropbox. Michael. A question from Corrine, uh, going back on the humanities question, do you have an example of a project in humanities that engaged non-academic partners in the process? We do. Um, we, we have a, um, a SHRC partnership grant uh, from quite a while ago. It was one of the first uh, SHRC partnership grants uh, that was looking at um, studying the um, African diaspora. And it was partnered with um, universities and stakeholders in the Caribbean um, as a main point of, um, of historical um, slave trade. And there are agencies both in Toronto and in uh, the Caribbean, um, I can't remember which Caribbean countries, that were non-academics that were engaged in the development of that application. And so, and that is coming out of the Department of History at York University. And so uh, historical, uh, looking at historical aspects of with contemporary sequelae, um, on in um, the forced uh, migration of uh, African people. Okay, 
So, um, and then the final tool, this is linked under Emerald Publishing. Uh, it's a conference, all of these um, issues of problems, impact, indicator, stakeholders, dissemination, skills, all into one booklet. You can download it for free. They just want your email address to, so they can follow up to know how you're using it. Emerald is turning this into an online tool. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, it creates a canvas like this. If you can see from the lower left, what's your big problem? What's your specific problem in the top left? How, what's the brief of your research? What are your knowledge mobilization activities? What will the direct imp impacts be? And what are your next steps? And then at the bottom, this is the co-produced pathway to impact. What's your research, your dissemination, your immediate impact, and your longer term impacts? It brings it together in this one, what I call a canvas. This is not your knowledge mobilization strategy, but these are all the elements of your knowledge mobilization strategy. And having done this work through the booklet, come up with this canvas, then you're ready to write your one page, your two page, your four page, whatever you get from your grant application, you're, you can write your impact strategy there um, with this being the raw material. So Michael, I'm gonna pause there. I'm going to take this off sharing and I would happily engage in some discussion with the group. I see Eric Perrin. Are you familiar with the knowledge translation planning template from Melanie? Absolutely. Um, what, what I see with, so with Melanie, Melanie's is a tool that is particularly focused in the health space. And, um, and I, I, I have worked with the tool. Michael has facilitated with that tool on a number of occasions. What I find is that um, uh, it's a very deep dive when we don't always need the pool to be that deep. Right, so it's um, also a, um, it's a logical frame, but it is a, um, I find it to be a little more complex than the way that we presented ours. So um, I would think if you're in a health space, and if you are, are if you are, and it, it is also a tool that's meant for the researcher, it is the foundation of the, um, her skit, the science, knowledge translation training program, scientist knowledge translation training program. And it's, um, so it's a good tool for the scientists. I'm not sure it's as good a tool for a research administrator who is supporting um, across disciplines and needs a bit of a broader tool. That being said, a lot of um, what Melanie, well, a lot of where Melanie started is where Michael and I have grown off from. Like we, we, we used her tool in the early days and then adapted to um, create our tool. I see Corrine says a smaller project example too. Um, <laughs> Michael says, Melanie is the godmother of KM, KMB planning. She absolutely is, a huge respect. She's contributed and continues to contribute a huge amount to the sector. Um, Oh, Michael was giving Corrine a smaller project, an example of a historian with local libraries around civic history and public engagement. Michael, you need to unmute. Still need to unmute. No. Yay. There you go. All right. Are there any other questions? I'll give it about one more minute. The joy of having an hour is that we're not obligated to use it all. Uh, again, just to, to let everybody know, this is being recorded. Within a few weeks, it will be available on the Research Impact uh, website. Um, I guess one thing I could add, Michael, as people are thinking of typing if they have questions, is how many of these types of large-scale grant applications would you and I support a year? Do you think we'd be, how many applications would we support? I can't for, remember our data. Uh, in a year, it's probably either side of 30. Mm -hmm. Yep. And some of them don't need this deep dive. You know, right. some of them are just, uh, they come in and they're in good shape and we can comment. So we, we do about 30 a year and that's between Michael and Krista Jensen, our knowledge mobilization officer and myself. And so they have um, different, um, degrees and also depends, you know, if they come in the week before, we're gonna do something, but we can't do the deep dive that I've shown you with, um, with Nambusos. Eric Perron says he often has issue with timelines to measure impact. Ah, 
So what Eric, what I do, um, or Eric, what I what I do when I think about that is I, I have the researcher think about what is from research to the what's the big problem and you, you know how are you going to solve climate change or something like that and it's, it's not that that big but what's the long term impact that you can imagine but we're writing an application for three years or five years so what I then have them do is say okay within within the next five years where are you going to get. And so it's not necessarily, you've got to imagine who that end user is, but sometimes within the next five years, you're not going to get to your end user. You're going to get to the next user. Who are you going to pass the baton off to or your evidence off to? Who are they going to work with that that will then possibly have a, have, um, a health impact, you know, five or 10 years down the line? So it's important. What I, what I do is I, I work with them to think on the big picture. And they often want to stay on the big picture, right? We're going to, we're going to re reduce teenage pregnancy. Well, no, maybe what you're going to do is understand what are the cultural um, opportunities to pro for um, providing family planning activities within new Canadian communities or something like that, right? So what are you going to, what, who's the next user within the scope of the grant application? So I would say that our researchers get stuck in wanting to um, change the world and we have to help them think about what's the change that's going to happen within the next five years, recognizing that in some cases, the next user might be another academic, right? And this is often in, um, like in an engineering case, you, a basic scientist might pass off to an engineer who then moves it from basic research into applied research, but it's still in the academic setting, who then might pass it off to a company to be able to take that up. We need to help them imagine that logic sequence of events. Uh, Corrine, again, I've noticed that audiences are often defined very broadly in KMB plans. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one thing about, what, let me come back to, let me share my screen. Corrine, this is a good question because, um, oh, let me get here. Please do not say that this is your pathway to impact. This is not yours. This is a conceptual framework. This pathway to impact can be used for engineering. It could be used for social sciences. We can think of adapting it for use in public engagement and humanities. This is, you want to reference the co-produced pathway, but, uh, but you need to make a specific adaptation of this pathway to suit your purpose. Because the research that you do as a historian is going to be different than the research that you do with, as an economist and, well, and your partners are going to be different. How you disseminate to a grade school audience is going to be different than how you disseminate to um, government. And how, how you help government take up that research is going to be different than how you help an indigenous community take up that research. So um, the, the, I'm going to stop sharing because I have to write these numbers down. They're, they're amazing. In research on the Research Excellence Framework from the UK, which was a system-wide impact assessment, there were 6,679 impact case studies. I'm typing this um, in the chat box. And the research showed that there were 3,709 unique, I can't spell unique, but anyway, you'll get it, pathways to impact. But almost no two cases get to impact in the same way. And this is why you need to adapt. As we as, as uh, impact practitioners supporting researchers, we have to start off scratch by scratch um, at the beginning. Uh, with each case that comes to us and we need to be able to recognize that we need to support our researchers not saying I'm doing the co-produced pathway to impact but saying I've adapted the co-produced pathway to impact in the following way. And Aubert Landry has provided uh, for anyone at Université de Montréal he's provided his um, address courriel Aubert de Landry, Aubert.Landry at uh, umontreal.ca Excuse me. If any other Research Impact um, Canada representative wishes to share their email in the chat room so that their um, stakeholders on their campuses can get in touch, feel free to do so. So Michael, we've got a few minutes left. Any? Any reflections? Um, no, it's, it's, I've had the opportunity and the pleasure to, to hear you present this uh, a number of times and to provide some insight um, you know, I've had opportunities to work with Numbuso before. Um, it's, 
the way in which this has progressed and, and developed over the years. And there are other tools out there too. So I think it's an exciting time for all of us as, as brokers in terms of making the time to develop the relationship with our researchers and the prospective partners. And you'd, you'd made the point specific to those case studies, using these resources as a, a template to guide and steer our work. It's, it's not one size fits all for, for some folks that uh, the focus around the uptake, the focus around the dissemination. It, it's really a matter of, of tailoring it to the needs of, of our uh, researcher colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so again, just to reiterate, all of these tools that we presented are in the Dropbox and uh, contact us if you don't know who your local Research Impact Canada representative is. If you do, email him or her or them and uh, they will give access to your tools. Um, and Michael, is um, there going to be an evaluation of this? We will uh, we'll send something out within, within the week. It'll be an opportunity for you to provide some, some feedback, not only around this specific event, but uh, more so around future topics that you want to hear. Um, we have a list of all the participants, so you'll hear from us within a week's time. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone's involvement, and I am going to go out and shovel some snow. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.